Minority shareholders will now be empowered with the coming of a new Companies Act. What does that mean? I think the first point is that perhaps they've always been empowered. Um, the 1973 Companies Act does contain minority protections in it. However, under the new Companies Act, these protections and rights available to minority shareholders are significantly enhanced. Mm -hmm. I think the context behind it that we have to remember is that the new Companies Act in large part has been designed and drawn up by North American legislators. Mm -hmm. And these minority protections feature very prevalently in North American legislation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the people that have drafted the new legislation here yeah. have brought that in because that's really their, their background. All right, so how do voting rights for minority shareholders change under the proposed revisions? And um, there are concerns that they're becoming excessively empowered. Is that a fair comment? Um, I think, first of all, um, under, the, under the current system, 75%, if you own 75% or more of a company's shares, you are in, you're entitled to do pretty much what you like with the company. You're okay. entitled to dispose of the, the majority of the business, dispose of the shares, and the minority shareholders really don't have much say in what you can do about that. Um, under the, the new act, that has changed, that has changed radically. I think we see it at two different levels. And first of all, you know, as a corporate finance house, we're not saying that minority protections are a bad thing. Mm. For large companies, for, for multinationals, for big on-market transactions, we see these as a very good thing. And actually, some of the tools, they're going to be new tools available for large companies to conduct mergers and acquisitions. And it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens mm. with that. However, we're just worried about the bureaucracy and how things might be delayed or pushed out for a significant period of time with smaller companies and with private companies. Let's talk about issues around buying back their shares at fair value yes. and creating that fair value and how the process works. Well, this concept of fair value, this is really where it, the fun and games is going to be because no one has any idea what fair value is. Everyone knows that fair value is in the eye of the beholder. It's different for a buyer and a seller. So this is minority shareholders are always going to think they, their shares are worth more than actually they are. And we always think that you, when you took up a minority shareholding, you accepted that you were a minority shareholding. But as we said, this is, this is now going to create quite a lot of fun and games. Um, we think what's going to happen is that uh, people are going to have to apply to the courts. Mm. The courts are also not going to know, a judge is not going to know what fair value is. And so he's going to go around and perhaps appoint people like us to try and determine what, uh, well, you what fair value is. should be happy then. More is. business for you coming <laughs> forward. Absolutely. Kwebi, if a minority shareholder is not happy about a proposed merger, they now have the right to invoke the appraisal of their rights. And this is where the whole issue of fair value comes mm. to the fore. How does it complicate the equation? Well, I think firstly, I think, you know, know that, sh know that buying a share in a company is an at-risk type uh, activity. Mm -hmm. So your capital is at risk. You can go up in value and go down in value. Mm -hmm. I think firstly, like James has said, well, how do you create fair value? That becomes a moot point because how do you do this? It becomes quite difficult. And this is a willing buyer, willing seller, which a market, which is what a market creates at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But a secondary issue which I think needs to take, be taken into consideration is that minorities mustn't see this as, a, as, as somehow a thing at which takes away the risk. Whereas if a company is trading at a very low value and potentially this fair value price is far higher, that they potentially can just opt out at a fair value or a higher price. And I suppose that's a question that I'd like to ask James. Is I mean, James, you've, you're sitting with a company, okay, it's trading at far below net asset value. Okay, so it's a company which is now in serious trouble. So the majority shareholders go and say, how do we save this entity? What do we do with this entity to let it see the, you know, the light of day, potentially two or three or four years down the line? But now, in, in essence, you're sitting with a whole bunch of minorities which are opting out at a, put, at, a, at a put price at a far higher level. How do you guard against something like that? I, I'm, not sure you, I'm not sure you can, actually. Um, these provisions are, are unalterable, so you can't waive them in, in the new Act. Mm -hmm. And again, these are all unknowns and ifs and buts. And it's going to be quite interesting to see how, it, how this develops. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first couple of transactions, to see the first couple of people that object, to actually see what, what things happen. Um, because you're, you're exactly right about this fair value issue. But I mean, in, in essence, it changes the listing landscape as well then, because maybe there should be different rules for, for the large board or the main board and 
and potentially for the smaller balls, such as Alta X and so on. And potentially where this could have ramifications up in Africa, there's potentially should be different rules up there as well. Potentially more Alta X type rules. Mm. Because how do you, are you going not, are you not potentially stifling the, um, uh, the, the listing landscape, so to speak, uh, because smaller companies might just look at the rules and say, look, this is too onerous for me, you know, to potentially be part of. Yeah. I think as, as, an international, as an international firm, that's what, that's what we're concerned about, mm -hmm. is that especially in a developing mm -hmm. economy, we need to see a vibrant market, mm -hmm. we need to remove bureaucracy mm -hmm. so that we can get things happening, mm -hmm. so that we can get the normal market dynamics happening. Yeah. And this is what we're very worried mm -hmm. about. Yeah, we also, we're concerned that mm -hmm. a lot of transactions on market also mm -hmm. don't necessarily need to be cash-based, mm -hmm. they would just be share-based. Mm -hmm. But with these new regulations in place, a company is always going to have to have cash available for a, gr a disgruntled minority. Let's talk about the relationship between the majority shareholders and the minority shareholders, just using Kirby's example and analogy. If the majority shareholders feel that they need to rescue an entity by selling it off at a, at a lower price, can they in any way uh, make the minority shareholders waiver their appraisal rights and just literally force them to go the path with them? No, they can't. Um, in, the, in the new act, this is called an, un, an unalterable provision, so you can't, in your memorandum or, or articles, the new, the new thing, you can't waive these rights. However, there is a provision in there that says um, that if a minority shareholder objects and is trying to get a higher price, and if that and majority shareholders had to pay them out that higher price, and that would result in the company being in financial distress, the court can then say no you can't get paid out that price. However, again, it just comes back to the whole thing that we, it's just the bureaucracy and the time that we feel that transactions are going to take to occur. Up until now, minority shareholders could resort to what is called the 25% rule, where they could at least convene a meeting with others, lobby their case, and then try to stop an acquisition. Do they still have some of those options available at their disposal? Absolutely, I mean, that hasn't changed. The special resolution, which is at 75%, in other words, if there's a 25% plus one, blocking that is still very much in place however what the new act has brought into place is that you would still need a special resolution to conduct what they call a fundamental transaction ie you need 75 percent and under the current legislation you can then force that transaction through however if 15 percent of those 25 percent minorities get together and object to this they can take it to court and even further on from that, even if a shareholder holding 100 shares or 1% feels there's a problem, he can invoke these appraisal rights. So it's quite, it's quite difficult to, to work out. Mm. The 75% is still legislation, is still very important, mm. but actually someone with 1% can object to this and has a put option on the company. Is this whole process a fait accompli because the Companies Act hasn't come into effect? Um, we're expecting it to come into effect October 1st, but many experts are saying that's not even a feasible date. Yes, I think we are also of that opinion that we're far too far down the track for it to come in here. There is talk of it coming in very early next year. However, with the Companies Act are the regulations, and the regulations obviously enhance and define a lot of the, the aspects in the Companies Act. Those regulations haven't been published and are still out for comment. Mm -hmm. so, so that's where we are at the moment with that. Okay, and in terms of changing the general uh, complexion, of boardroom politics and mergers and acquisitions. How's this, uh, how are these provisions and proposals going to change things? Because a lot of those who are affected as minority shareholders tend to be BEE partners and fund managers. And we know that there's a lot of debate around BEE and uh, boosting black equity in businesses. Absolutely. I think we think that um, there definitely will be a change in the M&A landscape. As I said, there's actually in the new companies that there's also there's a new mechanism which has been introduced called an amalgamation or a merger. This hasn't been available before. So we think we're going to see quite a lot of interesting, uh, interesting activities happening. Um, for BE and fund managers, yes, absolutely. They've certainly got a much bigger, a much bigger stick, much more leverage with which to um, take on the majority mm -hmm. shareholders mm -hmm. and push up the price that they could get in any, in any okay. potential. Yeah. We know that M&A activity had almost dried up because of the credit crisis. And now, even though there's a lot of interest in African companies, it's an issue of the credit lines. Mm. But all things being equal and the environment generally improves, mm. um, what do you think this kind of impact this is going to have on uh, mergers and acquisitions? 
Well, I think firstly, if you just look at the legislation the way it is at the moment, it just changes the whole legal framework for you know how you do a deal and, and potentially how you put this thing together. I think there's a lot more room here for lawyers to make a lot more money, <laughs> <laughs> potentially, which is not a bad thing. It's just you're just changing. I mean, you're just changing the way in which this whole thing works. I, I mean, I think my, my first issue uh, with this whole thing is, does this change the landscape for listings? Specific, specifically on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Are there going to be different rules for smaller companies and different rules for larger companies? And I say that with, um, with knowing that the minority shareholders often you know, have got the short end of the stick. I, I know Kwebi posed this question to you, and because he's posing it again, maybe he needs a more comprehensive <laughs> answer. You're suggesting that it doesn't change things fundamentally, it's just going to make things a lot more bureaucratic, and for the smaller companies, a lot more expensive. Anything else that they should mm -hmm. consider? Well, what we've been recommending to people is if, if you're thinking about a corporate action, um, perhaps do it now, before the New Companies Act comes into place. You've got certainty around the law, there's a lot of, there's a lot of case law from the history, you know what's going to happen. Yeah. We think what is going to happen when it comes in is there's going to be a huge amount of uncertainty. Yeah. Um, there's the first couple of cases, no one's going to know what to do, it's going to go to the courts, they're not going to know what to do, yeah. and the whole process is going to get um, elongated. So people, if people are interested in getting through a corporate action, getting on with their lives, they might want to, uh, they might might want to think about doing it now rather than waiting. 